Okay, folks, I need your attention for a moment. Uh, approximately three hours ago, um, several terrorist attacks took place across the city of Paris. Um, my understanding of, as of a few minutes ago is that more than 100 people are dead. Uh, there are hostages. The French border is closed. Um, a state of emergency has been called. I know nothing more. But I wanted to ask you to please join me in a moment of silence for those who are lost and, and for all those who love them. Thank you very much. Session 186 is a celebration. And we begin this session by welcoming new officers. New officers take office at midnight tonight. <laughs> the council has decided that at the moment, I became president three times. Uh, right after the business meeting, at the end of the meeting, at the end of the calendar year. <laughs> now officers take office during the meeting, rather than the law afterwards. Our incoming council members, Includes Sarah Wiley, Oscar Javier Maldonado Castaneda, and our incoming 6S representative is Erica Amethyst Shemansky. I believe only Erica and Gwen are here. Would you both please stand? And let me talk with you. Let's talk. Push on by asking you to please join me in congratulating, thank you, great appreciation, because these three people have worked hard for the past three years. Council members, as you know, work on price committees, but both Trevor and I have been working them hard. Um, we have a token of appreciation for each of them. Wendy, do we happen to have tokens of appreciation for our outgoing council members? I see you, but don't hear what you said. Two seconds. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is ask those, those three folks to stand and um, let you know that you will be receiving the token of appreciation because I have a really tight scheduled program here. Um, at the appropriate moment in a few minutes. So, uh, Vivian, Vivian Bogerson, Kelly Moore, and one more quo, would you please stand? Personally grateful. Last spring, we uh, began announcing the Techno Science um, uh, uh, 
our presence, and we have announced all about the STS meeting and doing awards, as you know. And I refer you to the, uh, the new um, the program highlights book. that includes the full-length presentations that we published in this spring, and the statements of acceptances, images, copies of the works uh, completed. To leave time for the Bernal Distinguished Lecture, which we are inaugurating at this meeting, the committee chairs and the winners have agreed to hold their presentations to two minutes each. <laughs> we begin with the Mountains Award. Ah, uh, wait. We begin with the tokens of appreciation. <laughs> I'm pleased to announce the winner of 2015 Nicholas Simonich Prize, Gary Levy. Her winning paper is entitled The Context of Control, Information Power, and Track Writing Work, which is published in Journal of Information Society. The 2015 Nicholas Simonich Prize is shared by me with three members Claire Waterton, Abby Kinji, and Samuel Tedler. The Manus Prize is awarded to the best paper written by graduate students. Uh, last year, we received 42 papers submitted by graduate students, not only of STS programs, but also programs in sociology, anthropology, history, information studies, women's studies, and many other fields. The paper from Ms. Levy uh, stood out, among others, due to the paper's topic and empirical site that is understudied within the STS structure. The paper critically examines the way in which electronic monitoring <coughs> is structured to control the flow of organizational information and workers in the American long haul tracking industry. Ms. Levy's paper elegantly presents ethnographic and qualitative data to investigate the production and distribution of information in the tracking industry that primarily aims to facilitate firms' control over trackers' daily work practices. Interestingly, the paper also reveals how trackers act as independent agents to respond to the monitoring technology in a manner that results in distinct power relations between the firm, individual tracker, and information technology. Ms. Levy's paper is beautifully written and offers a solid theoretical analysis on how the technological system is politically constructed. The community believes that Ms. Levy's paper deserves the prize primarily due to its significant contribution, both theoretical and empirical, to the STS scholarship. The paper was written when Karen Levy was a PhD student at the Department of Sociology in Princeton University. She is currently a postdoctoral fellow at New York University and will be joining the Department of Information Science at Cornell University in fall 2016. Uh, due to a maternity leave, Dr. Karen Levy is unable to come to accept the award, and Jennifer Tessie will be accepting the award on her behalf. I would like to invite Dr. Jennifer Tessie to come forward. on behalf of Karen Levy, and this following is the text she sent me and asked me to read. I'm honored to receive the 2015 Nicholas C. Mullins Award for my paper, The Context of Control, Information Power, and Truck Driving Work. 
I wish I could join you in person at this year's meeting, but a new baby is keeping me busy at home for the time being, so thanks to my friend and mentor, Janet Bertessi, for accepting on my behalf. I'm so grateful to the award committee, to Janet and the other members of my dissertation committee, Paul DiMaggio and Kim Chappelle, as well as Hamid Ekbia, Yanis Kalinikos, and Bonnie Nardi, who edited a special issue of the Information Society in which the paper was published, for helping me to develop its argument. Most of all, I'd like to acknowledge the many truck drivers and other members of the trucking community who shared their time and expertise with me, inviting me into their trucks, their homes, and their workplaces to help me understand how technology affects their lives and their work. I'm humbled by their generosity, and they made this research enormously rewarding in ways that I never could have anticipated. Thank you. Prize Committee, that is Mary Alshon and Yuko Fujigaki, selected the following paper as the winner. Benjamin Simpson, Chris Henke, Repairing Credibility, Repositioning Nuclear Weapons Knowledge After Cold War, Social Science 2012. In the process of selection, we received 23 papers, three from self-nomination and 20 papers from editors of six papers, six journals. This paper deals with the maintenance of the credibility of U.S. nuclear weapons after the Cold War and examines how the weapon scientists have avoided a crisis of credibility, showing that their knowledge is deeply embedded in the design and testing of these weapons. By addressing the question how such a technical system are maintained over time, the authors make a very important contribution to STS research that aims to understand how systems survive over time, and the processes involved in maintaining their coherence and boundaries. The conceptual work to combine insights of ethnic methodology and conversation analysis on repair with STS insights on credibility and tacit knowledge has resulted in a convincing account of how nuclear weapon scientists in the US have avoided a crisis of credibility. The concept of social technical repair introduced in the paper provide an important heuristic tool for other STS studies on the working processes involved in the maintenance of social technical system in times of crisis. Thus, this paper highlights an area that most STS papers have largely neglected and opens up the new research direction on social technical repair. Therefore, this paper deserves the award. Congratulations. So thanks, because it actually has a 
I'd just like to second everything that Ben said and add what an honor it is to receive an award named after David Edge. In 1998, I attended my first forest meeting in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And after my panel, I was kind of wondering if anybody knew what the heck I was talking about. And who should come up to me and approach me and talk to me about my paper, but it was David Edge, who mm -hmm. said, hey, that was an interesting paper. You should think about this, that, and the other thing. And it was maybe two or three minutes of his time but it meant the world to me to have a legend in the history of STS and the editor of Social Studies of Science take the time to talk to little old me. And I think that really speaks to the spirit of collegiality and uh, the spirit of mentor mentorship that we have in us that makes the organization really great. So thank you so much. It's a great privilege uh, to present the first ever 4S Mentoring Award. Um, the 4S Mentoring Award is part of um, an explicit emphasis of Gary Downey's presidency to recognize forms of important academic labor that normally go unrecognized, unacknowledged, and unnoticed. And it's a special privilege for me to recognize the work of mentoring since I certainly could not have become any sort of scholar had it not been for my teachers, who did not even teach me, did not just teach me in a formal academic sense, but have for many, many years been friends, guardians, sources of example and inspiration. This is the kind of work that really ought to be recognized in institutional ways. Um, I would like to thank my co-chair, Sharon Shawik, and members of the prize committee, Kim Fortune, Sally Wyatt, and the Andrew Medina. Um, this was a prize um, where we solicited nominations. We received a number of uh, nominations. Um, they were really wonderful to read through because it gives an indication of the breadth and depth of mentoring activity that um, happens in our community. It was also an extremely difficult set of nominations to read through because um, there were no fixed criteria to think about what constitutes uh, mentoring that can be evaluated. And one of the things that we were very keen to do was to try and look beyond the kinds of metrics that are visibly and institutionally recognized in the United States, which is primarily the mentoring of PhD students, so that they go on to become individual visible researchers. So we were interested also in paying attention to forms of mentoring undergraduates, master's students, postdoctoral fellows, faculty colleagues, um, especially colleagues who um, might be women and minorities and so on. Um, it was an extremely um, enriching, and rewarding and challenging process and to hand over the first uh, mentoring award um, to my privilege to introduce Thank you, Kaushik. It's a pleasure working with the committee. Um, I want to say that obviously we're awarding this to Maureen McNeil, and McNeil's mentoring, collegiality, and collaboration have, we saw evidence, has been, uh, she's been generous and powerful for four decades across disciplinary, institutional, and national boundaries with both students and colleagues. Uh, she enacts and circulates a pedagogy of critical questioning with open and respectful debate and a pedagogy of generosity in promoting others' work. She's been active in generating two innovative venues for scholarship, the journal Radical Science, also known as Science as Culture, and a book series on the intersections of cultural studies, feminist science studies, and STS. At Lancaster, she's been a director of the Institute for the Women's Studies a chair of the Center for Science Studies and director of the Center for Economic and Social Aspects of Genomics. As an administrator, she has worked to transform class and gender-based discrimination in academia, plus build infrastructures for new kinds of scholarship and careers. She's brought together ideas and people across several fields into lasting webs of relationships, building new and powerful lines of inquiry, infrastructure for that work, and a generation of scholars. Now, Maureen McNeil is helping us to launch the Forest the Forest Mentoring Award. It's a great moment.
honored to be the first recipient of this award. And first of all, I would like to thank those who did the invisible labor of making that possible, the members of the committee, and indeed my colleagues who, without me knowing, nominated me. I also, um, as I said in my statement, regard this, and I think this was explicit in the way it was introduced, as perhaps the most relational of all the 4S awards. And for that reason, I see it as a testimony not to what I've accomplished, but to what the collaborations, the teams I've worked with, the groups I've worked with, have accomplished over the years. So I'm very grateful to all my students and all my collaborators, my team workers, and other administrators from whom I've learned as much as they've learned from me. And also, I think, there's a danger, or at least there's a certain pleasure in making this a romantic moment of celebrating collaboration, teamwork, and collegiality. And I relish that. But also, I'm mindful that there's another side to all of that, that it's hard work, that it's challenging, and indeed, that it sometimes doesn't work. And so I'd like to formally apologize to those of you who I've collaborated with that it hasn't quite worked. <laughs> to the students I've supervised and not seen them through to success, and some of them have been successful despite me. <laughs> and finally, I really want to end, and no one will be surprised about this, on a rather political note, and to say that I regard this award, not just for me personally, but for the whole community as a stand against neoliberalism, that it represents the valuing of collegiality, of community, and collaboration at a time when we're all being encouraged to be ever more entrepreneurial, individualistic, and competitive. So I welcome this award on my own behalf, and I welcome a community that has a sense of alternative values. Thank you. scholarly practices that go beyond conventional outputs of paper and book publications. The concept and planning of the STS Making Doing work were developed and uh, arranged by the STS Making Doing Committee, which, include, which includes five STS scholars, me as chair, Joe Dumit, Jalen Wu, Tun Zidarin Jarak, Sarah Wiley, and Nina Wainford. For the inaugural year, over 80 proposals were submitted, and after a thorough review process, the presentation was selected by the committee to participate in a spectacular SDS event that took place yesterday. It is the longest session ever happening in Forest Minutes, <laughs> starting from 12 o'clock to 4 p.m. And I'm extremely glad that the event went very well and was truly enjoyed by meeting attendees. I have to thank all of the SDS making doing participants because despite limited facilities, the committee was able to all participants put a lot of effort, time, and resources in making the event incredibly successful in terms of engagement, interaction, and enthusiasm. Now, STS, STS Making and Doing this award is not a competition. It is a celebration of a variety of scholarly practice that shows a wide range of opportunities for contributing to better development of knowledge, technology, and society through what Gary Downey calls critical participation. However, we would like to give appreciation to those whose presentation offer inspiring ways of making and doing that open up new perspectives, both for methodological concept as well as pedagogical approaches in continued growth of the STS scholarship. After a two-hour discussion between the committee members, which took place right after the end of the program on Thursday, we have reached an agreement to award three winners of the STS Making and Doing Prizes. 
Each of the three winners will be announced by my fellow committee members, Joe Dumit, Jalen Wu, and Gonzalo Director. The order of these announcements does not reflect rankings or anything of the sort. Thank you. I, I was so excited yesterday to see how much energy, interest, excitement, and sharing was going on in the room. And so I'm very pleased to announce one of our top three. Uh, this is uh, Max Lebron for Civic Laboratory Plastics. Uh, she runs the Civic Laboratory for Environmental Action Research. And this was something that combines classrooms, activism, science, theory, in most inspiring ways. She describes it as having a, running on principles of action research, citizen science, participatory research, feminist technology, DIY, and do it with others. And she gives a she has an amazing set of projects. You should check out her website in terms of like working with fishermen to ask them what they think social, collective, and environmental justice should look like, and then working with them to come up with projects that actually answer their concerns. And so one of the things she did was make the low-cost survey equipment to replace very expensive equipment to get the data and environmental intention, uh, attention. This includes baby legs, which is made out of baby tights, soda pop bottles and helps uh, scan the water and collect plastic pollution. So by te for teaching STS, by helping others work together, by embodying feminist and justice issues, and making technology that does change, she really embodies making it do it. Third, first SDS Making and Doing Award 
goes to experimental methods, experimental engagements across the divide with Sarah Klein and Yelena Meisner. <laughs> Experimental engagement across the divide stresses that in order for SDS to become critically engaged, it neither needs to be oppositional to scientific practices, nor does it need to enact an SDS expert position. Considering scientists as interlocutors rather than objects of study, Klein and Guzman engage in experiments in which their own understanding is put as much at risk as that of their scientific interlocutors. Their experiments in a cognitive science lab unpacks the implications of the social of social cognition scholars as well as of the SDS scholars involved. Positioning themselves and their collaborating scientists as co-designers, subjects, and or co-interpreters, Klein and Guzman move SDS making and doing well beyond the deficit model of SDS knowledge travel. All involved both bring much to the experiment as well as learn much from it. Their symmetrical and reflexive approach to SDS involvement in knowledge experiments makes experimental engagements across the divide a truly worthy recipient of this SDS making and doing award. Congratulations. Responsible engineers to work in environmental justice challenges. Now, the book offers a rich ethnographic study of Louisiana communities and their struggle to combat industrial chemical pollution. The book was full of surprises. At first, it appeared as a story about engineers becoming responsible by delivering technical knowledge as a helpful contribution to the public debates about ensuring a healthy and prosperous community. In other words, a successful case of social corporate responsibility. How great were these engineers? However, as the book develops, Olimé identifies a critical refinement in how industry expertise is deployed. Rather than simply providing facts, industry representatives also depicted themselves as residents and caring members of the community who had equal stake as citizens in ensuring the community health. She shows how these strategies obscured the unequal power relations between industry and the citizens. Thus, she, reveal, she reveals how the intersection of new chemical industry strategy, new roles of government, and not least community pride, combined ultimately to reduce the community's opposition to pollution. Insightfully, Alina shows how the stakes in these battles were not just about illness and health, but also about how environments involve sounds, scents, and sights that profoundly shaped people's feeling of emplacement. The latter insight came in part by way of the author's own deep reflexivity, which was another remarkable and impressive aspect of this book. For example, Odinger describes how angry and defensive she was after months of fieldwork when her boyfriend criticized the aesthetic and political qualities of the town she studied. Reflecting upon her own reaction enabled her to better understand how the citizens she studied was swayed by the industry's claim to want to ensure the beauty and spirit of the towns that they were at the same time polluting. Moreover, she needed to show her how her observations and interpretations shaped not only by her presence uh, at research sites, but also by the questions she was asked by SDS and other scholars as she presented her work while it was in progress. She reports on her audience's insistence that she answer the question of whether residents made the choice to move before or after the pollution occurred. Adinger used these queries to theorize the ways in which residents' choices, not the industries, had become normative ways of understanding toxicity. 
Thus, in an innovative way, she uses the SES community and other academic communities as both sides of ethnographic observation and as sources of new ideas in her work. It is the committee's view that when Odinger has by her eloquence and sensitivity to the meanings of environments, produced a book that stands out in its intellectual and methodological contribution to the SES field. Congratulations. When one writes a book, one has this wonderful opportunity to thank everybody who helped in the production of it in the acknowledgments section. Um, and I'd like to reiterate those thanks. I won't um, list people out because we'd be here all night, but I do want to thank everyone who made this book possible in big and small ways. Um, and there are so many of you in this room. And um, what this prize means to me is in part an opportunity to thank a second group of people, which are the people who have engaged with the book since it has come out. And that is a rare and wonderful opportunity. And so I say thank you to all of you, starting with the prize committee, Vivian Lagasin, Wen Hapo, Jessica Maskin, and Kelly Moore. Um, I'm especially indebted to Kelly Moore for making it possible for the, there to be an author meets critics section for the book, um, and to Kim Fortune for organizing that session, Allie Kenner for cha chairing it, Scott Frickel, Dean Musma, Barbara Allen, and Jessica Smith for their wonderful, thoughtful, and challenging uh, comments about the book. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you who have talk to me about the book, um, ask me questions about it, assign it in your classes, all those sorts of things. It's um, the, the only greater pleasure that I've had than writing the book has been in um, talking to you about that work that was so important to me. So thank you all very much. from UCSD and I speak on behalf of the FLEC committee uh, and uh, the FLEC committee chair um, is Leandra Medina and my co-committee member is Kenji Ito. Um, so much praise has been showered upon Lachlan Jen's malignant How Cancer Becomes Us. Nature described the book as simply brilliant. Kirkus described it as quote uh, dark journey into cancer as it is treated in American society today. Others have called it a tough gift for all of us, a book that shows the limits of existence and the poetics of resistance. A piece of incredible scholarship, the book is a transforming and wonderful reading. The Fleck Committee found Jan's book simply stunning in its incisive bridging of scholarship and STS across a range of methods, from historical to anthropological. We were impressed by just how widely the author cast the net to find the resources taken up here, from Blanchot to Nixon's War on Cancer, from cancer narratives to historical films about DDT from classic feminist texts on cancer experience uh, to archival medical sources, legal resources, and um, malpractice law. Drawing on Lachlan Chen's expertise in the interpretive analysis of injury and malpractice law, this book is truly a tour de force in which Jen covers uh, cancer science, cancer care, without missing either the fine textured detail or the big picture of policy issues. 
The book is written at the highest level of STS scholarship, written beautifully and in a manner that is also deeply socially responsible. From now on, and because of Jan's book, we will see and experience cancer differently through the lens of our field and through the lens of a colleague who spared no measure of restraint in research, in anti-normative critical analysis, in unadorned political interrogation of self-knowing and feeling through cancer. With my colleagues, Leandro Medina and Kenji Ito, I am delighted to have the honor of presenting the 2015 Black Prize for the best book in science and technology, uh, in, in, in science and technology to, to Lachlan Jen's Malignant How Cancer Becomes Us. Thank you so very much. It's so beautiful to stand here and to see so many of my mentors and friends in the audience that I've made over the years here. And the book wouldn't have been written without you all. And thank you for discussing the issues with me, for providing and writing such beautiful work yourselves for me to read and dialogue with. And all I can say is that I'm very deeply honored, and thank you very much. The winner of the 2015 John Desmond Bernal Prize is John Wall. I am up here representing the, uh, the committee, uh, consisting of Madeline Krish, uh, Lucy Suchman, Knut Sorensen, and myself as chair. The Bernal Prize is our society's highest award. <coughs> awarded to an individual who has made distinguished career contributions to the field. I think probably all of us in this room have been in intellectual and material conversation with John's work for many years, if not throughout our entire careers. This enormous body of work, this enormously influential body of work has provided formative, generative, points of orientation for really you know, a vast array of projects. You know, he's published 50 articles since 2010. <laughs> Perhaps the best way to honor this body of work is to talk about the next project coming out in the spring. With Matter and Press, the new open access book publisher. John is uh, co editing with Evelyn Rupert the book Modes of Knowing the Empirical Baroque, a new collection that asks, How might we think differently? It brings together leading scholars in the social sciences, all of whom are interested in non standard modes of knowing. The resource for doing this that the various contributors direct their attention to is the Baroque. Writing the introduction, in the introduction, John addresses the question, why the Baroque? One answer is that the Baroque made space for and fostered many forms of otherness. Pretty clever, I think, actually. It knew things differently 
It knew about different things. It knew extravagantly and excessively. It knew in materially heterogeneous ways, and it apprehended that which is other and could not be caught in a cognitive or symbolic net. It's pretty cool. It also knew in ways that did not gather to a single point, and knew itself to be performative. A great part of a Western, the great Western division between rationalist and non-rationalist modes of knowing, the Baroque is therefore a possible resource, a resource for creating ways of knowing differently, a storehouse of possible alternative techniques. Not to say this is not to say that it is the right mode of knowing. The book's authors do not seek to create a Baroque social science, whatever that might be. And they also work in very different ways. So with that as thanks and as congratulations for the gift of a career of scholarship, and to transition to a thank you for your willingness, John, to deliver our inaugural Bernard Distinguished Lecture, working under the title Provincializing STS, Postcoloniality, Symmetry, and Method, I ask all of you to join me in congratulating John Law and thanking you. I want to humbly thank the Society uh, for its award of the Bernal Prize. STS has been close to my heart uh, since I first came to it, and I am profoundly honoured. I'm deeply grateful too for this opportunity to address our annual meeting. Maureen McNeil, my colleague at Lancaster, warns us against romance but I'm afraid I don't take the warning entirely seriously, Maureen. I've been very lucky. I've worked with a series of groups and people uh, throughout, uh, throughout my career. I've been very lucky with friends and co-workers. Um, I owe an immense debt to Anna-Marie Moll, with whom I've worked for, for many years. I particularly want to mention colleagues at Lancaster. Um, I was at Lancaster for a fair period, and now I'm retired, I'm going back to Lancaster. I, Maureen has a wonderful colleague, we've already had a chance to honor, honor her at the society. I want to mention Lucy, Lucy Stutchman, incoming president for 4S, and other people, others, including Vicky Singleton. And I just want to finish this moment of romance by complaining bitterly about the students at Lancaster. There's a whole row of them down there. Um, they, they, are, they, they were, or they have been for me, a challenge and an excitement, and they've, um, it's been really fun working with them. And what I particularly like about them is the way in which they take nothing for granted. So, thanks to the, thanks to the committee. I deeply appreciate the award, and uh, thanks to, to four hours. I don't, I don't actually want to reminisce about the past. Um, instead, I'm going to make a pitch for a post-colonial STS, and in particular for an STS that uses non-Western analytical resources. 
Our discipline knows that techno-science works differently in different global locations. And with many fine case studies of colonial and post-colonial exchange and domination. Indeed, we have analogous studies within the North to remind us that Euro-America is scarcely a monolith. But, and here's the but, STS has mostly worked with Euro-American theory. There are, of course, exceptions. I think in particular of Warwick Anderson's beautiful study of the Fore and Kuru, which draws in part on Melanesian understandings of the gift. I also think of Judith Farquhar and Chi Quang Zhang and then Mei Zhang, who asked what it would be to think through Chinese medicine. But, and here I follow Caspar Brun Jensen and Atsuro Morita, I want to argue for forms of post-colonial STS that make systematic use of non-Western analytical resources. The terms I need for this talk, binaries such as theory and practice, or Western and Southern, are all too simple. Post-colonial relations of exchange and extraction are complex. Indeed, the term post-colonial is troubled too. But my core point is about analytical tools and empirical materials. So, Itty Abraham catches what is at stake when he writes, in the metropolis they do theory, and in the colonies they gather data. He's talking about science, but the point, his point can be extended. Thus, Shiv Visvanatha cites Dharampa, who devastatingly argued that agriculture in India was an epistemology that the colonial British destroyed. This shifts the argument to production or to epistemology and production. And Darwei Fu, the Taiwanese founding editor of East Asian Science, Technology and Society, the journal, brings the same kind of reasoning to STS. He writes, haven't we taught our students with good case studies still mainly coming from the West? Haven't we theorized our East Asian case studies also mostly from established Western theoretical perspectives? His question, how far can East Asian STS go, stands before us as a challenge and provocation. Deepesh Chakrabarti explores the difficulty of such post-colonial intellectual asymmetries for Western-trained Southern intellectuals. In 1856, 15,000 tribal people were massacred by the British in Bengal. Warning shots did not stop those people. Still, they kept on coming and dying. Why? Their God had said he would protect them. That was the survivor's story. And Chakrabarti's problem, it's this. As a Western and trained historian, he knows that gods are not really powerful. But as an Indian, this makes him deeply uneasy. So his question is, should he be giving priority to Western historiographic conventions, or instead to a world in which gods, not just beliefs about gods, cause action? Now, the STS principle of symmetry catches a part of what's going on here. David Bloor's idea that we should treat all beliefs, true and false, in the same terms. But this doesn't solve the problem completely, because it works on the assumption that STS will stick fairly much with its own theories. To say this isn't to complain, symmetry was crucial to SSK and its ANT extension to human and non-human actants by Michel Callan was equally important. But here's my proposition. It's time to extend it again. There are reasons for caution, but nevertheless I suggest that STS should now think about working with a third and post-colonial version of the principle of symmetry. 
What would this say? Well, we can debate, but here's my provisional suggestion. It would explore the politics and analytics of treating Western and non-Western terms symmetrically. That is, it would take both seriously. Which means that it would no longer automatically privilege Western categories. In such an STS, analytical terms would no longer travel in one direction, from a metropolis to a periphery. Instead, the traffic would be two-way, or better, it would be multi-directional, since there are multiple post-colonialities. So we would have multiple symmetries and multiple versions of STS, and there would be no centres and peripherals, or perhaps better, many of them. But how to do this in practice? To think about this, I want to tell a more personal story. In 2009, I went to Taiwan to lecture on ANT and its successor projects. The invitation came from Wen Yuan Lin, who worked with me at Lancaster University as a PhD student. I talked about heterogeneity, relationality and all the rest, and ended up by telling the Taiwanese audience that the world isn't coherent. So we need methods that are also themselves multivalent and non-coherent. For good me measure, I added the lesson that I first learned from Donna Haraway, that we should work in tension-ridden ways since what we write is politically performative. The discussion that followed was disconcerting. Sin Xing Chen, a professor interested in religious studies, told us that he'd just taken his students to the final, uh, to the final day of the annual outing of the goddess Matsu. Matsu is popular in Taiwan, and an impossible number of people, around a million, had tried to get into her Taizhong temple. Chen and his students got nowhere near that temple, but the crush and the noise was unbearable. He, it was also, he said, an event without listen, an event without a straight or coherent narrative for itself. He went on, and I'm quoting him, I was particularly attuned to the messiness messiness of the whole event. And I want I think I want to argue that messy method at this moment here in Taiwan, the struggle against grand narrative in general is not that productive. Helen Varan talks about the embodied disconcertment which happens when di different metaphysical systems collide. For her, this took place in a Nigerian classroom. For me, it happened in that seminar. Sinsing Chen's comment crystallized the following obvious difficulty. STS was telling me that what we know is situated but I was talking to a Taiwanese audience as if the need for messy method was a decontextualized truth. To put it mildly, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> yes, of course, I should have seen it coming, but I didn't. So the question then followed, what to do about it? When you and Lin and I have been thinking about this since 2008, about what a, chi a, ta a Taiwanese or a Chinese inflected STS might look like. Crucially, and this really is neither a throwaway nor a courtesy comment, this is an entirely collaborative process. For us, it could not be otherwise. No doubt, post colonial STSs can be done in other ways, but the benefits of a bilingual collaboration seem substantial. And that collaboration has taken us to theory and to questions about methods and writing. It has led us inexorably into metaphysics, for the Chinese language world often rests on assumptions quite unlike those current in Euro-America. It has led us to think about embodiment, and it has taken us to institutions, career patterns, and to modes of STS circulation and exchange between Taiwan and Euro-America. That's the list I've just whipped through. 
Our suggestion then is that these are the kinds of issues that any post-colonial STS will need to attend to. But, okay, the question is what might this mean in practice? One answer takes us back to Helen Varan and Dipesh Chakrabarti. It has to do with metaphysics, embodiment and disconcert. For instance, when Yuan tells me that he sometimes feels that his head and his body are in different places. That his head is full of Euro-American theory and knowledge while his body inhabits Taiwan. He created this PowerPoint for me to illustrate the point of view. <laughs> Perhaps Sin, Sin Xing Chen was feeling something similar. And I know that analogous wrenching bifurcations have been explored in other contexts, including feminist writing. I'll briefly return to metaphysics in a few moments. For the moment, let me touch on institutional contexts. Here are some obvious but striking observations. One, in Taiwan, most social science academics have done their PhDs in the US or the UK. Two, they have returned to Taiwan, schooled in social constructivism or ANT or feminist techno sciences, whatever. Three, this means that the already small community of STS academics in Taiwan is theoretically fragmented. Four, it also means that these academics find themselves at the margins of their particular international networks. Five, the Taiwanese government encourages academics to publish in well-ranked SCI journals, and they are materially rewarded if they do so. Six, in practice, this means that they're encouraged to write in English for English language journals. And finally, seven, they're located in institutions which look, as the old joke puts it, just like any other North American campus. That's the list. Some of these conditions, of course, are particular to Taiwan, but here's my guess. Conditions of academic production and exchange like this are at work in many places outside Euro-America, within it for that matter. And this is why I think they're so important. The message then is that to think well about post-colonial forms of STS, the discipline will need to think simultaneously about analytical tools, empirical research and subjectivity but also about some pretty matter of fact, not to say crass, institutional practicalities. And somehow it will have to shift all of these together. Otherwise, it will carry on reproducing an analytical case study post-colonial divide <coughs> while separating minds from bodies for those who don't inhabit English or dwell in the centers of English language STS. So, institutions and asymmetrical modes of circulation lock Taiwanese STS into a position of subordination. Indeed, they've also eroded alternative modes of knowing and learning. That's point number one. Point number two is about alternative explanatory logics, logics that don't belong to the English language. For, as STS carries its theories to Taipei, such alternatives get locked out of the discipline, both in Taiwan and beyond, with real explanatory consequences. To see this, let me take you to a Taiwanese consulting room. When Yuan says this isn't the best photo of him ever, but he agreed to let me use it. So, in, sorry, Dr. Li is a distinguished Chinese medical practitioner. You can't quite see her, that's her hand. She's popular with her patients too. She's been university trained in both Chinese medicine and Western biomedicine, and she works with both. 
She's been talking to a patient. Let me quote from Wen Yuan's field notes. The biomedical scan revealed no sign of arteriosclerosis, she says. The tests have eliminated some possibilities. We'll stick with my previous diagnosis, the pulsation of the qi position, which shows that you are constantly drawing out energy from your kidney meridian to keep your body going on a daily basis. Then she adds, the pulsation tells us about the overall dynamics and function of the meridians, but it doesn't tell us about all sort of somatic morbidity. So we can also make good use of biomedical tests. We can also make good use of biomedical tests. So that's interesting. Why? Because Dr. Lee's practice includes biomedicine, but doesn't fit with biomedical <coughs> logic. There's no room for meridians or chi in biomedicine. They can't be found anatomically or physiologically, so they don't exist. But for Dr. Lee, it's different. Here, there's room for both scans and meridians. We're dealing with a number of Chinese scholars have pointed out, we're dealing with another kind of logic. I don't have the time to do this properly today, and all sorts of health warnings about large categories and binaries are appropriate, but it's something like this. Biomedicine is reductive. Of course, in practice it's different, but in principle it's reductive. In principle, it assumes that the body of the patient is a particular way. It tries to describe this, and it searches out background causes in order to intervene. As Judith Farquhar notes, in biomedicine, facts are facts are facts. An object, she says, must come forward for every noun. In contrast with this, Chinese medicine is syncretic. It hybridizes. It looks for patterns of association by seeking out analogies. It searches for contextualized propensities and imbalances. And it is situated because objects are contextual. They are gathered, as it were, relationally. As Farquhar puts it, in Chinese medicine, things are our partners in perception, not the mere objects of our perception. None of this is news. Post-colonial anthropologists, including Mario Blaza and Marisol de la Cadena, have worked on analogous issues in quite other parts of the world. And sinologists and medical anthropologists, such as Farquhar and Meijan, have explored these kinds of differences at length. But my question is, what would happen if STS also started to think symmetrically? What would happen if this got absorbed into our academic work. One response is that a Chinese inflected STS won't, wouldn't, won't go looking for causes or strong explanations. Instead, it will observe what goes with what situation. And it will ask questions about whether what it is observing is in balance or not. It will, in short, work more like Dr. Lee's Chinese medicine than biomedicine. So what might this mean in practice? One answer is that it, is that it suggests two radically different post-colonial stories about biomedicine and Chinese medicine in Taiwan. Yes. Dr. Lee takes biomedicine into her Chinese medical practice, but this can be understood in two ways. Perhaps it's a reflection of biomedical, co colonial, and post colonial power. The sto that story is pretty persuasive. It's even more convincing if we add that after 50 years of Japanese colonization and the post war period of Americanization, 96% of Taiwan's insurance healthcare budget goes on biomedicine, with just 4% left for Chinese medicine. The argument then is that Chinese medicine has been pushed to the margins, and 
as in Dr. Lee's practice, where it's hanging on, it's under pressure to absorb the realities of biomedicine. That's post-colonial story number one. But story number two, in a Chinese inflected STS, is different. Why? The answer has to do with hybridity, the refusal to embrace reductionist forms of explanation, and the assumption that objects are relational, not given. So, for instance, 2,000 plus years of Chinese medical history reveal that, it has, that this has always worked by absorbing newcomers. When something new came along, this didn't overturn previous practices or ideas. Instead, it was added to the canon. So the classic yellow emperors in a canon, which is nearly 2,500 years old, is a hybrid of five schools of ancient medical practice. And this is a logic of addition that has been at work ever since. So what does this history of accretion imply? The answer is that biomedicine is nothing very special looked at from this point of view. From a Chinese medical point of view, it's little more than the most recent arrival. And like its predecessors, it's found its place within the syncretic, non-reductive, and object-relational world of Chinese medicine. So what we're seeing in Taiwan has as much to do with Chinese medical business as usual as it does with biomedical <coughs> domination. There is, of course, much more that might be said. But at its simplest, Wen Yuan and I are suggesting that we have two kinds of post-colonial STS here, two versions of explanation. To be sure, neither is pure in this conjoined world, both bring STS and Chinese realities together. But they do so in very different ways. One absorbs a Chinese explanatory sensibility. It is Chinese inflected. It does Chinese explanatory business as usual, while the other, by contrast, using STS, ex STS explanation as usual, does not. So far, so good. But when you and I have also been asking this question, what would happen if we were to use a Chinese term to understand European materials? And we've been thinking about this for the Chinese notion of shu. And what we've done is to use this term to explore the UK's 2001 foot and mouth epidemic. Shu means something like propensity. In many Chinese contexts, including medicine, things have propensities to shift and change their form. There is imbalance if you block those changes and the flows that run through them. Such is the basis of much Chinese medicine, diagnosing and undoing blockages and imbalances. But things don't have propensities. This is because they are situated in relation, ebbing and flowing between non-binary and complementary opposites. Think of yin and yang. There's a methodological point here. The art of knowing and intervening well is the cultivation of a sensibility to propensities and their changing ebbs and flows and working with these rather than against them. Methodologically, the implications of this shift are quite radical. Representation becomes less important than sensibility. A relational version of the empirical is important in Chinese medicine, but uh, epistemological foundationalism is not. It's easiest to see this if we look at Chinese classical philosophy. Here, accounts of the world, usually in the form of advice to princes, look quite unlike those that we know in Euro-America. Indeed, they mostly don't look like descriptions at all. For instance, the Taoist Tao Te Ching is paradoxical, aphoristic, elusive, and poetic. The world and its propensities are not fixed, cannot be pinned down, are contextual, and therefore elusive to representation. I don't have time to talk about this today, but when you and I have been experimenting with Dao De Jing inflected accounts of the British foot and mouth epidemic. This is work in progress, but in some cases, these look more like aphorisms than empirical stories. That's an empirical story in this version of possible version of a Chinese inflected STS. And it mimics the Dao De Jing, the style of the Dao De Jing. But there are also more straightforward methodological implications. In another classic, 
Sun Tzu's art of warfare, strategy is about maximizing advantage by detecting and working with propensities rather than struggling against them. Once again, subjectivities are on the move. In Sun Tzu's world, a great general, a military general, cuts an unheroic figure. He, it would always be he, he doesn't flaunt himself. He's an invisible, subtle, and flexible manipulator who influences circumstances precisely to avoid battle. In this world, slaughter in warfare is always a sign of failure. Applied to the 2001 foot and mouth epidemic, the story that emerges is distinctive. The disease was eradicated, yes, but in this Chinese way of thinking, the mass slaughter tells us that the, stra the strategy was catastrophic. Effective, but, as Sun Tzu might have said, inefficacious and, un and unwise. And the supposed heroism of the politicians, this simply underlines the fact that they were lousy generals commanding a bankrupt strategy. Now, there's plenty of Brits who would agree with that for other reasons. <laughs> Uh, but the Chinese inflected account starts to tell the story in a different way. To sum up, I hope that Chinese language STS scholars might imagine creating a Chinese inflected STS. As a part of this, I also hope that they can find ways of levering themselves out of the grip of the Euro-American analytical institutional complex. But I've talked about my work with Wen Yuan today, not because I want the rest of the STS community to take up a Chinese inflected STS. Most of us, myself included, don't speak Chinese, and such a goal would make no sense at all. Instead, my broader object has been to say that our STS is surprisingly parochial and to show that we can provincialize it by imagining it in different intersecting modes in different contexts. We in STS should be proud of our collective work. STS has developed powerful tools for understanding and raising critical questions about techno-science practices. It's worked on inequalities, including class, ethnicity, gender, and post-coloniality. But what I think it hasn't quite brought into focus is the way in which it itself remains provincial. Of course, it's not wrong that it started in Euro-America. Neither is it wrong that it uses English language tools and sensibilities. But today I've suggested that it would be wise if STS made its terms of international analytical trade a topic in their own right. The issue is not not the creation of national STS. This, those would merely reproduce hegemon hegemony in other forms. Rather, it's to think about the implications of exploring post-colonial symmetries. The idea that STS terms of art might not simply come from English language Euro-America, to think about STS in ways that are indeed Chinese or Spanish or Hindi inflected. I appreciate that this won't be easy. STS is dominated conceptually, linguistically, bodily, metaphysically, and institutionally by provincial Euro-American and especially English language practices. But if the attempt were to succeed, then we would have created a plurality of intersecting STSs and sensibilities. And we would be able to say that we have undone the provincialism of our STS. I doubt whether John Desmond Bernal would have approved of the means, but his commitment to overturning injustice suggests that he might have sympathised with the aspiration. Thank you so much for your attention.
two, three. Please. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have as loudly as possible. As loudly as possible. Okay. I'm a little bit scared about postcolonial symmetry, and I'm scared because it seems to me that symmetry speaks from a position and is a function of privilege. I'm so sorry, I'm not hearing. I'll translate. Okay, can you hear me now? I'm a little bit scared about symmetry. <laughs> so my fear is that the notion of postcolonial symmetry speaks to a position of privilege, where the ability to be symmetrical comes from privilege that I don't think we're very good at analyzing or admitting. So my fear is how, if we use postcolonial symmetry, and if we engage in that sincerely, how do we prevent it from becoming just another way for white settler academics to co-opt indigenous ontologies that colonized people cannot use and speak from that same symmetrical position? It makes a perfect sense. Thank you very much. Um, the answer is I don't know. It's not a fixed position. It's a move right here and now rather than a sort of general claim that it should be this way. In a position of privilege, and I mean, let's not fool, we shouldn't fool ourselves in this hall, and I shouldn't fool myself. You know, I'm in a position of, of privilege. Many of you are in positions of privilege. We need, my argument is that I need to think about yet, about that privilege in yet another way for the time being and see what emerges. It's not fixed. It cannot be fixed. In 10 years' time, you know, <coughs> this thing won't take off. It's far too difficult. But in 10 years' time, if it did, then it would need to be taken apart and moved forward anyway. Thank you. Number two. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a little suspicious of symmetry, but I thought uh, it's just an image question. I mean, the twins are what you're doing. And I'm thinking of the problems of decolonial, decoloniality in relation to post-coloniality, and in particular in relation to the sorts of issues Kim Talbert was raising here in two very powerful presentations, and I know Christina Lyons will have more to say about it tomorrow, uh, which has to do, uh, in a way, with Marilyn Strathair and says it matters which ideas think ideas. It matters which ideas, uh, not uh, the, the fundamental practices of, of ideas thinking ideas is the work to be done. And Kim was pointing out the failure of citation, that even stuff published, um, for example, uh, in uh, North American indigenous writing, directly relevant to uh, uh, analytical apparatuses for studying and characterizing relationality, even the published work is not cited. And the work to be done to uh, come to know the, the citations. And also, the, I think the fear, this is, this is the question, this is actually a, a direct response um, and a question. I believe that we shut up when we were afraid of being wrong, and that the danger of appropriation uh, of marginalized positions by simply taking them and using them with our institutional power is real. But our response has been repeatedly not to do so uh, and not to engage in the kinds of apparatuses of, of, of real exchange. Uh, many Native American communities now have apparatuses to enforce more serious epistemological as well as other sorts of collaboration. But I'm interested in your ideas about, if not exactly symmetry, how the institutional apparatus of, of taking up uh, these kinds of thinking through what, where, where do you find fruitful and happening in the get a full talk on that? But I'd like to hear more about your your ideas on both. Oh, Lori, thank you, thank you, thank you. The question is entirely well taken. And, and that's why I made that list at the, uh, near the beginning of the talk of sort of a bunch of things which range from metaphysics up, up there to you know infra infrastructures of one kind or another down there. I think it's a horrendously difficult thing to shift because because it's complex, because it's partly conceptual, because it's, it's metaphysical, because it's uh, substantive. Um, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't, I really don't have a good, a good answer. I just think we have to. I want to be attending to all of these things, and I want to be imagining other ways of knowing and of transmitting knowing. So I didn't talk about it. Uh, I didn't talk about it. But the Chinese Academy is a newish invention modeled substantially on Western ways of knowing and transmitting knowledge. 
there are other ways of transmitting knowledge, there were, and there still are, other ways of transmitting knowledge about, say, Chinese, for example, about Chinese medicine, that don't meet the so-called international standards and are therefore, that have therefore been mar mar marginalized. I didn't, I didn't go into, the, into that, I, you know, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do everything at once. I don't think any of us can do everything at once. But I'm quite certain we, we, we need to be working on, well, the kinds of things you're pointing at, other ways of knowing, other institutional contexts for knowing. I don't want to appropriate my, 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 my I mean, I hope, I mean, if, if the symmetry term rings the wrong bells, discard it. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care. I don't want to appropriate the best, as it were, or whatever it is, of other forms of knowing of other worlds into STS. I want a lively multiplicity of, of, of STSs, and that implies shifting institutional structures, subjectivities, embodiments, and all the rest of it, as, 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 as well as modes of knowing. So I don't, have, I, don't, I don't have an answer. It's collaborative work that we need to do across different communities. And one more over here. Um, I'm really very sympathetic to the ambition that you have, and I just wonder why um, the large body of work in STS dealing with the borders between science and non-science wouldn't be more foregrounded, because this is uh, involving also change over time. So I often get a little uncomfortable when biomedicine is put up in such a static way, and, and I know you said it's an abstract way, but it's a historical phenomenon. It wasn't always that way. It doesn't always have to be that way. Judge Parker sometimes does the same thing, and I'd love to work. The other legal point is that in China, as far as I know, biomedicine has greater monopoly over certain life and death matters than what is often labeled Chinese medicine. So to characterize the, a region of the world as pluralism flourishes in some ways is a little bit misleading because biomedicine has more of a monopoly. People can issue death certificates. People can sign birth certificates. So, so there already is a, a kind of a background that's been fought. So the, the question I have is really about the principles of justice and what we're studying things for. And so if you're studying in order to show that it gets lost in translation, if you're studying things to it, uh, broaden people's horizons epistemologically, I'm all for it. When we, when we remove the ancestors from our cosmology of explanation of why we suffer or why we're not well, we lose something. And I think it's perfectly fine to talk about that. But not every region of the world has coherent text-based systems that you might resurrect. So I'm just curious about the principles of justice that, that are undergirding the normative values that underpin some of the ideas you're promoting that I'm actually ironically really sympathetic to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the <laughs> I, 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 I actually feel quite easy about the term justice. And that, that, that's a whole lot of other arm of the phrase thing. It, it, it brings normativity and politics or, 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 or whatever that is in, in, a, in a particular <coughs> I mean, I happen to be where, sorry, I happen to be where I am working with, with, with Wen Yuan. We happen to know, know, think we know some things. Um, and so, I mean, what I'm doing is, what we're doing is, situ is, is situated in context. I don't, in principle, at all see why it can't be done elsewhere. I mean, I'm actually hoping to be working with some Sami people of, in a very different post-colonial set, quickly context. Uh, where texts are substantially absent. It's, it's, it's a very, very different, but the issue is the kind of issue raised by Donald, the, the issue is the kind of issue raised by Donald. How do you generate, create, knowing context, com knowing spaces, institutional and all the rest, right, that makes it possible to know in alternative ways, in ways that necessarily are in part shaped by and responsive to the kind of ways that most of us work in. We're not talking about cultures or locations that, 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 that are disconnected. On the historical point, of course, I entirely agree. And on the substance of, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm not holding on China as the, as, as, as the next big move. I'm trying to open up a possibility, right, or open up a question uh, of, sort of how do we think about doing things differently? How do we think about um, an STS 
So what does it take for a post-colonial symmetry to be symmetrical? The questions that I just heard, in a way, affirm the importance of calling attention to the full range of, of types of scholarship in which we are engaged as STS scholars. The, the scholarship of infrastructural work was in Donna's question, it seems to me. Perhaps even the scholarship of mentoring. And maybe the scholarship that's involved in practices of STS making and doing. Let us please continue calling attention to those practices that include, but also extend beyond, the scholarly article and book. Thank you, John. This is important, and I'm really excited that we now have a Bernal Distinguished Lecture. I once again thank Lucy Suchman for the idea, and John for volunteering when I first spoke with him. And now I would like to ask um, Professor Lucy Suchman, I should say, President-elect Lucy Suchman to approach the stage. says the forest president. <laughs> the, 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 this, is a, uh, this is a long distance relay, a long, a temporarily long relay that's been going on for 40 years and hopefully will extend for a much longer period of time. So I would like to present you with the, we pass the relay, or pass the baton. <laughs>
<laughs> with which to One more person um, who we would all like to thank, and that's Daniel Reslow. And is he here? <laughs> He's, off He's off working somewhere. Um, but obviously, I mean, you can only begin to imagine the amount of work that's involved uh, in, in organizing uh, a conference like this, and uh, it's been beautifully done. Um, and so I have, um, I have some, some things for Daniel, which what, when we get him back in the room, we'll, we'll give him. So I just wanted to say a couple of things, um, because I, I want to just say that along with um, consolidating uh, the contributions that, that Gary's already made to the well-being um, of the society, um, I hope to do some things which actually follow on quite well. From, from John's um, lecture, uh, which comes out of the question of uh, what does it mean to be an international society post-colonially? Um, and that is a society that acknowledges its location, um, but, but also recognizes its international, international transnationality of its constituents. Um, that is international without imperial ambitions, uh, but rather working in solidarity and in complementary uh, with sister societies worldwide. I don't know the answer to this question, but I really want to explore it. And I recognize in the conversation that we just had that one of the elements of this is the term we. Um, that that term has to be used with enormous care um, and in a way that, uh, as Donna would say, stays with the trouble. Because on the one hand, the premise that we need to become um, non-Eurocentric uh, in some ways erases all of you who are already in this room who are not <laughs> part of that we. I'm looking at Ivan de Costa Marquez, um, Tanya Perez Bustos, who's on our board. Um, we have, yes, to, so we have many, many members who are already thickly engaged uh, in other SDSs uh, here in the room. At the same time, there's no question that those of us are, who are here in the room are the ones who could afford to come to Denver, be in this hotel, and that that um, is, is materially reflected in the bodies um, who are present. So uh, we, we are a we of a particular uh, formation. Um, we, we want to transform that, and we also want to recognize how much we already are other than we might think we are. Um, that is, how much we are already uh, not just um, Europeans, North Americans, etc. Um, so I think, as I say, these are really tricky questions. I don't honestly know exactly what it means to be an international society uh, in, a, in a time when increasingly we have regional societies, we have national societies, um, and uh, I think there's a place for, for us in that kind of ecology, um, but it, it really needs to be articulated, and again, it needs to be articulated in, in in collaboration uh, with um, with with our 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 sister societies, um, and the other more substantive or specific kind of uh, discussion that that I'd like to convene, that I imagine convening, um, is something along the lines of its working title, which is constantly shifting. Um, is something like um, interrogating the threat, and I use the word interrogating uh, advisedly here, uh, interrogating the threat as it's figured um, as and in relation to bodies, persons, and multi-species collectives. Uh, and the announcement that Gary made at the very beginning uh, of this, um, uh, around the events in Paris, uh, we can now all anticipate how the threat that how that threat is going to be constituted. Uh, and I think we have to be very actively engaged in critical um, analysis 
of how the worlds in which we, uh, we are living now are, are figured um, as threatening uh, by whom, for whom, uh, and we need to do that um, together. So I hope that we'll be able to spend some time on it. Uh, I, I would really like to find a way to, um, to make our forest conferences a little bit less breathless, um, give us a little more breathing room, but I'm not sure how to do that and, and still have as many of us here. Um, but I, I just want to end by saying come to Barcelona in 2016 uh, and come to Boston in 2017. And we don't yet know exactly where you should come in 2018, uh, but we will soon. But anyway, see you all next year in Boston at the East Forest Meetings, which should be absolutely fantastic. So, thanks. Now to the <laughs>